Here we are on the third Sunday of Advent. As you may have noticed in the last several Sundays, we've been basing each of our services on a different verse in Silent Night, Holy Night, because it is the 200th anniversary of its writing coming this Christmas Eve. So each Sunday we've taken it verse by verse and focused on a few words from each of those verses. We started out looking at the first verse words of sleep in heavenly peace, right? And then the second Sunday, we look at the second verse and the words glory stream from heaven afar. And this week, we're looking at the third verse, redeeming grace. Now, I know that these are out of the usual order, but I know that we can also be flexible. <laughs> so we are, we'll follow the verses of Silent Night. And certainly, redeeming grace is all about love. Silent Night, Holy Night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face. We know these words so well, don't we? Last week, glories were streaming from heaven afar, and they're still streaming now, but they're radiating from the face of the baby Jesus. Son of God loves pure light. What radiance, what love. Our scripture readings tie into these verses from Silent Night, Holy Night, from the Gospel of John, as Luke told us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory in Jesus. For God became a human being like you and me, and came to this earth and lived on it, fully human and fully divine. You and I didn't get to see him then, but others did, and they wrote down their experiences into our holy scripture so that we too might come to know this glorious sight of God on earth. An amazing sight. But wait, there's more than that. For the scriptures go on to say, from God's fullness, we have all <coughs> received grace upon grace, Grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. You know, we know this verse so well from Silent Night, Holy Night. And we hear a lot about grace in church. But do we really know what grace is? In the original Greek, grace meant favor or gift. And in our understanding of God's grace, in the church, it is that God loves us, so, loves us so much that God gives us gift after gift. And we haven't done anything to deserve such generosity. God gives us these gifts for free. We don't pay a dime. And not just once, but over and over again, grace upon grace, God loves us and sends us these gifts. Our scripture reading from Romans goes on to explain it even more, and those of you who took the Romans Bible study this fall know what a challenging book Romans is. But I know that you're also very good students, so if anybody has any questions after this sermon, you can ask the students from that Bible study. In Romans it says, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, yes, of course. We are so far from the glory of God in our own lives. There's no mistaking us and God, right? We've all done the wrong things over and over again in our lives. But even so, God still loves us and continues to give us all these wonderful gifts. As Romans says, we are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right, so we just talked about grace, right, and how that means favor, favor overflowing, love, God's love overflowing so much that God gives us wonderful gifts 
way better than Santa Claus. So much better. That's what grace is. But now we get thrown in another big word here, redemption. Or as the song says, redeeming grace. With the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Redemption. What is that? In the church, redemption is, it's like we were thrown in jail, rightly so. But Jesus has come and bailed us out for free. Jesus paid to get us out. We have fallen away from God so many times, and yet <coughs> Jesus comes to rescue us, to pay our debt, to redeem us. So redemption. Redemption means saving or freeing us from our sin. It means restoring us back to the way we were, the way God made us, so that we can have a fresh start. Well, these are big theological terms, and we don't think about them a lot day to day. But I was trying to think of how I could explain it a little better. And I got to thinking about something that happened to me a long time ago. It was around the year 2000. And my family and I went to the American Girl doll place. Anybody ever been there before? A few of you. All right, so you know a little bit. You can kind of picture it. This is Kirsten. And she's been in the family for quite some time now. And that day, so long ago, my daughter and I had been looking at the American doll catalogs and sort of drooling over all the wonderful things there. And I love American history, so of course I'm just grooving on the whole way it's all pulled together with the dolls with historically accurate clothing, not at the moment. Um, and all the accessories all work together. It's a wonderful way to learn about American history. So finally, we got a chance. They opened up a store. It wasn't just in Chicago anymore. They opened up a new store in New York City. So we made a pilgrimage down to New York City and went into this American girl place. And the downstairs was magical. All these little boxes full of accessories and the dolls. and It was just amazing. And my husband and my son kind of zipped through that part pretty quickly. <laughs> but Beth and I really enjoyed looking at each little thing and admiring every little thing we saw there. And then we went up, as my memory serves me, I think we went upstairs to the second floor and looked around. There's still more things to see there. Just amazing. And there was, a, there was an American Girl doll hospital for dolls that you know, became amputees and needed new arms and things like that. And I just thought, well, that's a good thing because it happens, you know. And then just down the hall from there, I saw something. We all saw it. We were together at that point. And we stopped in our tracks because there on the wall was a sign. And it said, Doll Hair Salon. <laughs> Who ever heard of a doll hair salon? I never had. And underneath the sign, there was a cluster of girls, they must have been about 10 years old, about my father's age at the time. A good group of them, and they were all holding their dolls at this area, waiting. You could just see how excited they were. So excited. And I knew why they were so excited, because some of you may know this, but when you get a doll, often comes in a box, and it often for some reason comes with a clear cellophane thing around the head, which is just wrong. <laughs> How can you do that to a doll? I mean, it's keeping the bangs down, but first thing, you, you rip that thing off, because I mean, you can't have a doll going around with a plastic band around her head. And she looks pretty good for a while, and then the day comes when you just know the braids have to come out. Just gotta take them out. And so you do. And then you comb the hair and you play with the doll and you put on the shoes. And it's pretty hard to get the shoes on, so you, you don't have to do it like this. <laughs> it's a challenge. But you know. And the days go by, and the weeks go by, and the months go by, and the hair starts to look kind of ratty. So you try to braid it again, but you know, it just doesn't look that good. <clears throat> But you can go. I could see.
see it there. You can go to the doll hair salon and get your doll looking back just the way she did when you first got her. Oh my gosh, who knew? I'm still standing there watching these excited little girls clutching their dolls. So excited because they know pretty soon their doll is going to look brand new again. Brand new. From the back of my head, I can hear scripture echoing. I hear the voice of God. From Revelation 21.5, Behold, I make all things new. <laughs> it's true. I'm standing there with scripture in my head, looking at these girls. Tears are welling up in my eyes. I'm getting choked up. I can't talk. I'm having a religious experience in the store. And then I hear another voice. It's my husband. <laughs> He's standing right here next to me, looking at these girls, these delighted girls, so excited. And he speaks. And he says, what a rip-off. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of that. I think maybe it means that Mike was not having a religious experience. <laughs> maybe some of you understand this experience that I had. Maybe some of you are more like Mike, and that's okay, I love him too. <laughs> Maybe you need a different illustration. I don't know what would work for you. Maybe if you like antique cars, and you manage to get one restored to its original glory, maybe that would be the religious experience that would work for you. If you could redeem your car. <laughs> redeem your car, make it new again. Or maybe you get that every time your car breaks down, you take it down to the car mechanic and he makes it run again. Maybe that's a religious experience for you, I don't know. Maybe when your computer doesn't work right and somebody comes along and fixes it, makes it new, redeems it, maybe. Whatever it is in your life that you have seen fall apart, and then somehow experience God in your life, making it whole again, making it new again. That's what redemption is, especially when it's us and our lives. Behold, I make all things new. God can make us new again. God can restore our lives. God can redeem our life because God loves us so much. God gives us so many gifts. We've done nothing to deserve them. We rip out our brains and end up with a rat tail. And God loves us anyway and can make us new again. What an amazing gift this redeeming grace is. And all we can do is say thank you, God. Praise God for these wonderful gifts you give us. Praise God. <laughs>